Hey folks, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking that since it's been such a rough go, I thought I would give you a pop quiz. So here's how this is going to work. And I will give you more extra credit pop quizzes um, throughout the rest of the semester. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just email your three answers to me um, or you can DM me your messages on Discord. Don't put them on the main server. Private message me because if you put them on the main server, well, I suppose if other people got extra credit too, it wouldn't be so bad. But send me your responses and I'll give you extra credit. Um, try to get these to me in a timely fashion. Um, definitely get them to me before your third exam. Um, so knowledge of the days of the week, colors of rainbow, and capitals of the U.S. are examples of blank memory. I will take two different answers. Um, you do not get additional points for giving me both. Just pick one. Um, damage to the blank can reproduce a decreased fear response and a reduction in the emotionally induced enhancement of declarative memory. And then finally, true or false, healthy adults continue to draw from risky bad decks in the Iowa gambling task. So for those first two questions, just give me two words and then either just tell me true or false for the third one. And try to either email that to me or DM that to me very, very soon. All right, so today we are going to talk a little bit about stress, but before we get there, I wanna talk about one of the most famous cases of a patient with orbitofrontal cortex damage. So we're gonna talk about the famous case of Phineas Gage. Um, fun fact that you may not necessarily know about me, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, my professional conference was in Boston and uh, me and my some of my fellow graduate students actually ventured out to the Harvard Medical Library on their Longwood campus, and we ended up actually seeing Phineas Gage's skull. Um, you are not allowed to take any pictures, though, um, but it's at the very, very top of the library. So Phineas Gage is one of the most well-known patients uh, that basically showed the role of the frontal lobe with respect to a lot of the behaviors that we talked about um, last lecture that we can expect with damage to the orbitofrontal cortex. So Phineas Gage uh, worked on the construction of a railroad in Vermont. Uh, Gage's job was to basically drill holes into rocks. If you want a railroad to work, the road has to be pretty flat. Um, so what they would have to do and what Gage would have to do is drill holes into rocks, add gunpowder, a fuse, and then put sand on top of that and then tamp the charge down with a large tamping iron. Um, those fuses would later be ignited, blasting the rocks away and creating a very flat surface for rail lines. Um, we're not exactly sure how this happened. I've been, um, I've heard that what ended up happening happened because somebody forgot to put sand in. Um, but there was an unplanned explosion uh, that basically propelled a meter long, like basically three feet long iron rod, uh, about one one and a half inches uh, in diameter through his head. So the entrance wound was right here under the right cheek. The exit wound was basically in the midline of the head. Um, the iron tamping rod landed 20 feet away and amazingly Phineas Gage actually survived. Um, so this is not actually Phineas Gage, this is John Harlow. Um, John Harlow was Phineas Gage's physician and Harlow is largely credited with describing the behavioral effects of that injury. So here is Phineas Gage uh, after his damage. Um, he was not able to actually use his right eye after this. Um, and this is the tamping rod that actually caused that damage. Um, here is um, part of his skull where you can actually see uh, the entry wound um, and the entry site for, um, for that tamping rod. So 
Gage unexpectedly survived. So here's what Harlow actually recorded. Gage was dazed, but never actually lost consciousness. And then he was taken three quarters of a mile away to John Harlow. Um, Harlow basically shaved Gage's head, removed bone fragments. Obviously, when you have a tamping rod going through uh, parts of the skull and the brain, this is not going to be a very clean thing. Uh, Harlow actually treated the wound with Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, and rhubarb. Um, this was not for healing purposes. This was basically to soothe pain. And I would also remind you that there were no antibiotics in 1848. The discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming had not happened yet. Um, so what ended up happening with Gage is that he ended up developing a brain swelling through his skull. Uh, this was treated with ice packs. He ended up developing a fungal infection from the wound, uh, but he did survive. Um, he had a loss of vision in his right eye, some facial paralysis and, and, and disfigurement. Uh, he returned to work less than one year after his damage, uh, but he did die 12 years later from uncontrolled seizures. And we're not entirely sure if that's because of the brain damage or not. Um, but what's far, far more remarkable about Phineas Gage being able to survive this is that he had very, very profound behavioral changes. And so Harlow documented these changes. And I would argue that Harlow's description of Gage's behavioral changes are somewhat vague, but I think they put these things in an interesting light. So this is what Harlow had to say about Phineas Gage in 1868. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, so didn't really take to authority well, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times per pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation which are sooner arranged than that are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. In this regard, his mind was radically changed so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer gauge. And given what we've read about what happens with orbitofrontal cortex damage, it should come to no surprise to you that some of these statements seem quite consistent with damage to the orbitofrontal cortex. Now, Part of the reason that we see this kind of orbitofrontal damage, in addition to Guinea, uh, Phineas Gage's uh, damage, in general, I want to go back to the bottom bones of the skull. So we already kind of talked about how the sphenoid ridge can be a problem for portions of the anterior temporal lobe and can contribute to amygdala damage. But this bad design of the skull also potentially causes easy damage for um, the orbitofrontal cortex. So right here we have the ethmoid ridge at the bottom of the skull here. And you can kind of see that because of this upper ridge, it makes a lot of sense that the portions of the orbitofrontal cortex could be damaged this way. And they also do make contact with that same sphenoid ridge, which could also cause problems. So a lot of traumatic brain injury can lead to orbitofrontal damage simply because of the bad design of the bottom portion of our skull. And to kind of provide additional credence to this, what you are looking at here is a jelly. So this is a jelly that was basically created to kind of look and have the same consistency uh, of the brain. And this jelly was basically put into a model um, of the skull. And you can kind of see that the areas that have maximal tearing and shearing, so this is the effect of a jelly on a violent rotational jerking in its plane, um, 
the majority of this occurs at the orbitofrontal cortex and the anterior temporal lobes. So the maximum area of tearing at, of this jelly mold is at the orbitofrontal cortex and that anterior temporal lobe simply because of the designs of the skull. So in addition to having damage to the orbitofrontal cortex, the Phineas Gage way, which is probably going to be fairly unlikely, um, different types of traumatic brain injury that might involve rotational jerking around, like things like car accidents, might also potentially cause this type of orbitofrontal damage. Now what you're looking at here are bilateral orbitofrontal cortex contusions where blood comes into contact with the brain, like a bruise. Now, what you're looking at here is a very specific type of MRI scan. Um, generally, these whiter portions are areas where contusions basically are. And you can kind of see that we do have some of that damage around the orbitofrontal cortex as well as the temporal lobe, uh, anterior temporal regions. Now, this is due to an accident. We do find that this is far more common in men. Men are a little bit more prone to risk-taking behavior. Part of that could be um, socialization. Like manliness is often associated with um, behaviors that tend to be a little bit risky. Additionally, there is some evidence that testosterone will increase the activity of the amygdala. Um, and because men tend to have more circulating testosterone, they tend to engage in more aggressive tendencies and more risky behaviors. Um, of course, contusions due to accidents are not the only way that this can happen. Here is the case of a tumor in the orbitofrontal cortex, which can also cause these issues. Um, here is an instance of an aneurysm where a blood vessel suddenly starts to burst. Um, and so blood basically damages part of the orbitofrontal cortex. So you can actually see that these darker areas are areas where blood has come into contact with neurons. Here's a case of orbitofrontal frontal damage, you can see those darker regions of the orbitofrontal cortex um, where blood has come into contact with the brain. This is what happens in the case of a motorcycle accident. So again, just to remind you, this kind of leaves us with the model of the limbic system that you see today. So given the link between these regions and the role of the orbitofrontal cortex in controlling emotional responses, the orbitofrontal cortex has been added to the limbic system. So the orbitofrontal cortex inhibits the activity of the amygdala, inhibits emotional responses, both our mental responses and our physical responses. And when this orbitofrontal cortex is damaged, it leads to inappropriate behaviors, disinhibition, um, emotional outbursts, possibly OCD, fighting, and generally increased emotional reactivity. So we're finally done talking about the different aspects of the limbic system. This is the modern limbic system as we know it today, including areas like the orbitofrontal cortex, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, the cingulate, the fornix, uh, the rhinal cortex, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the mammillary bodies, along with that orbitofrontal cortex. So we're done with the limbic system. Now let's talk about something that I think we're all feeling at this particular time. We're gonna talk about stress. Now stress is an important component of emotion. Now stress is often talked about in a very negative way, but I would like to remind you that stress can happen for good events and stress can be helpful. Stress can help remind us of what is important to us and it can also remind, be an important source of information. It is an important component of the emotional experience. And as we're going to see, there are environmental stressors and there are also strong biological components of stress. These will affect the limbic system both in the short term and in the long term. Now, I will mention that your system that registers stress 
was not designed to be a long-term thing. And because of that, the effects of stress over the long term can be detrimental. Um, so let's talk a little bit about stressors and stress. So a stressor, when we talk about stressors, stressors are anything that will produce a stress response. And that can be either emotional, which is what we typically think of. The current situation that we are in right now is a strong amount of emotional stress. I have a feeling that many of you are stressed for a variety of different reasons right now. Uh, for some of you, this shift to online classes um, can be really, really stressful. For some of you, missing out on some of the things that you had planned are really stressful. Um, just this entire pandemic and what it's doing can be stressful. The isolation that you might be feeling is stressful. And all of those are different types of stressors. But physical stress can also function as a stressor. That can include muscle strain, standing up quickly to shift your blood supply. I did a speed run on my treadmill last night. That is absolutely a physical type of stress. And a stressor will create a stress response. Um, this is a physiological response. Typically, it can be produced by aversive situations. Um, and this will involve the actions of the endocrine system. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about glands. In particular, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the adrenal glands. But the endocrine system also refers to things like your thyroid gland um, and the gonads, the testes and the ovaries. Now, the endocrine system is basically... Um, it basically is kind of like a neurotransmitter system, except it circulates through the blood. Now, if it's produced by the brain, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters. So be familiar with the difference between a stressor and a stress response. So let's talk about what might, how this might work if we're dealing with the amygdala. So a stressor could be something like a predator or something painful that's touching you, like putting your hand on something hot. And as we know, because these stressors are being registered by our sensory systems and part of the thalamus, they're going to make contact with the amygdala. And as we've mentioned, the amygdala has a lot of different outputs, but probably one of the most important parts um, outputs that the amygdala has when dealing with stress is the hypothalamus and the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. All of these areas are going to work together to basically activate the sympathetic nervous system. And as a quick refresher, the sympathetic nervous system is that basic fight or flight system that helps mobilize your body's resources to help you either fight a stressor or run from it. And so stressors tend to enhance sympathetic activity. And we largely think that this happens because of activation in the limbic system, the amygdala in particular. So I'm going to give you a heads up. If you don't like snakes, you're not going to like this next image, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, well, acute stress. I really hope that snake does not have any fangs. Um, so what happens when we are dealing with acute stress? So we're talking about stress over the short term. Um, Again, this stressor can be physical or emotional. Um, basically, anything that activates the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. So we're going to get sympathetic activation. Um, norepinephrine will be released from the brainstem. And when norepinephrine is released, um, what we're basically going to find is we get a variety of different physiological effects. So remember that your body needs energy to either fight or deal with the stressor. Um, so we're going to see increased blood flow to muscles so that you can either fight or run. 
We're going to see enhanced metabolism of glucose and fats because they're big sources of energy. We're going to stop digestion. Um, digestion is a time-consuming process. It is an energy-consuming process. And so during times of stress, you are not going to digest anything. Blood flow is going to be diverted away from those organs and more toward your muscles. Um, so one of the ways that you can kind of see this, this is kind of silly, but one of my favorite things to do after I engage in a pretty hard run is feel my stomach. It is ice cold. And part of the reason that it's ice cold is that, um, all that blood flow has been diverted to my muscles during exercise and not digestion. Um, we are going to see an increase in heart rate, an increase in blood flow, and a temporary increase in blood pressure. Sometimes during some of my worst anxiety attacks, I have actually found that stress actually spikes my blood pressure, so be careful with that. You need to be able to get oxygen. Um, to your body and your muscles and your blood. So the airways are gonna open to help facilitate that. And we are also gonna see a decrease in reproductive hormone release. When you're stressed, the last thing your body wants to do is mate. Interestingly enough, research has actually found that doctors that are working in the ER tend to have lower levels of circulating testosterone uh, than doctors that do not work in the ER. And part of the reason this happens is because stress reduces uh, both production of testosterone and estrogen. Those take time and energy, and when you're stressed, your body needs energy to fight stress. It doesn't have time or the energy to produce reproductive hormones. So this is what happens over the short term. So something that is very, very involved, what else is going on in your body when you're dealing with stress? And I'm gonna spend a long time on this picture. Um, this is probably gonna be one of your take-home essay questions. Um, so be prepared for this. What you are looking at here is what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is a direct feedback circuit of stress. So the HPA involves the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal glands. So I'm going to spend some time on this. The HPA axis works in this particular way. So you're out in the world and you encounter a stressor. So that's obviously going to stimulate the amygdala. Now, as we talked about before, one of the amygdala's outputs is to the hypothalamus. There's a region of the hypothalamus called the paraventricular nucleus. You don't need to know that. Um, but this paraventricular nucleus contains neurons that synthesize and secrete two different peptides during times of stress. One of those is vasopressin, and the other one is known as corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. Vasopressin is a hormone that is typically released when your body is dehydrated. So it allows the kidneys to conserve water. Additionally, vasopressin is a vasoconstrictor, which means that it's going to narrow blood vessels and it's going to raise blood pressure. Now, this typically happens when you're trying to restore homeostasis. So when you're dealing with stress, your body has basically been knocked off kilter. And vasopressin is your body's attempt to try to get back into balance. But let's spend some more time talking about this CRH. So CRH is basically here to help stimulate. So hypothalamus, the hypothalamus enhances release of corticotropin-releasing hormone. Um, CRH helps stimulate release of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Um, this peptide helps, so basically, corticotropin-releasing hormone and vasopressin help regulate the pituitary gland, and they turn on ACTH. So the hypothalamus stimulates release of CRH, which stimulates the pituitary to produce ACTH. 
ACTH then stimulates the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland produces what we call glucocorticoids. Um, if you've ever heard of the stress hormone cortisol, that is one type of glucocorticoid. The glucocorticoids that have now been released suppress um, CRH and ACTH um, in the hypothalamus and the pituitary, um, basically creating a negative feedback loop. So basically when the glucocorticoids get turned on, these get turned off. Um, in addition, there are many glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus, which means that we will get emotional enhancement of memory. So again, I'm going to run through this circuit one more time. So you're encountering a stressor out in the world that stimulates the amygdala and that stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing hormone which stimulates the pituitary, and the pituitary releases adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. The adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal glands, um, which create glucocorticoids. Those bind to the hippocampus and shut down production of CRH and ACTH. Go away, Zoom, um, and ACTH. So basically, we have this negative feedback loop. So once the glucocorticoids get released, the hippocampus helps shut this stuff down. So this feed, negative feedback loop basically helps keep the homeostasis of the body. As we are going to see, too much of a stress response is going to be really bad for us. Chronic stress can affect this HPA axis, um, and that will disrupt, disrupt the balance that we have, leading to many different health problems and, as we'll soon learn, memory problems. So what do the glucocorticoids do? Well, first of all, we call them glucocorticoids because they affect the metabolism of glucose. And they include hormones like cortisol, cortisone, and so on. Generally, they need ATP directed toward the muscles for action. So here are some different things that they do. They increase blood flow and they increase blood pressure. They inhibit the actions of the immune system, though. Um, they inhibit production of T cells. And additionally, we do know that the more stress that you sustain over a long period of time, um, the more that you are likely to get sick. It's part of the reason that you're hearing a lot of people say right now that you should kind of... Uh, be mindful of how much news you read because the more stressed out you are, the less able your body is going to be to be able to fight any sort of diseases. One of the things that we tend to find, for example, a lot of people who are stressed out are more likely to catch things like colds. Um, when I was in graduate school and very, very stressed, I would always get sick right after uh, right when winter break started because that period of stress was over and cold and flu season was around, I was more likely to get them because my immune system couldn't do its job. So the inhibition of the immune response might be really important for avoiding inflammation of muscle tissue and pain. And you generally want that turned off when you need your muscles to be active. Glucocorticoids will also reduce production of sex hormones. Um, generally, as I mentioned, mating and reproduction are not of prime importance when you're under stress. And those sex hormones are expensive to produce. You need that energy diverted to your muscles. So generally, this works pretty well over the short term. This nice little circuit works for short-term stress. But 
we deal with a lot of long-term types of stress and chronic stress is really bad for our body in a variety of different ways. Um, so generally here are some things that you will experience. They have been linked to uh, chronic stress. So hypertension, you can raise your blood pressure due to chronic, chronic stress, hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, diabetes, infertility, amenorrhea, which is basically um, ceasing menstruation. Um, so generally you will find that amenorrhea tends to happen under um, high periods of physical stress. You typically will see very competitive female athletes, especially when they're in peak physical condition. They will actually stop menstruating because they are under such physical stress. Um, we will see an increase in illness because chronic stress will dampen the ability of the immune system to do its job. Your body's energy is not finite. Your immune system needs energy too. If you're constantly putting your energy into fighting chronic, chronic stress, the energy that the immune system needs won't be there. Um, we will see an increase in insomnia, an increase in anxiety and depression, and also memory loss. So how does chronic stress lead to memory loss? Let's talk about it. So let's first talk about what happens under acute stress, short-term stress. There's a lot of evidence that acute stress can actually enhance memory for emotional information. Um, the hippocampus contains a lot of glucocorticoid receptors, and that will enhance uh, long-term potentiation. That will create new memories that have very strong emotional components. Um, Generally, we'll see this for things like uh, flashbulb memories. So for those of you, you probably don't remember September 11th, 2001. I was in college when it happened. Uh, this was a very, this was a period where at least for those of us not living in New York, the period of stress was very, very brief, but it tends to be very well remembered. Um, generally, we will also, ref we will also find that negative, um, Stressful negative information will tend to have enhanced memory as well. Um, generally, negative information is better remembered than neutral stimu stimuli. Um, and generally, that's because we're also getting activity from the amygdala. But something that's kind of interesting is that generally, even under acute stress, memory for non-emotional events are impaired. Now, part of the reason that this happens is because processing is being shifted in favor of emotional information. The emotional information seems to take precedence over the non-emotional information. So this is what happens with stress over the short term. It enhances memory. But what happens over the long term with chronic stress? So acute stress enhances memory for emotional information, but chronic stress impairs it across the board. Um, in small amounts, stress will enhance glucocorticoid production in the adrenal glands. And in those cases, the glucocorticoids will excite the hippocampus and will increase memory for those stressful events. But with prolonged stress, the glucocorticoids continue to excite the hippocampus by blocking glutamate reuptake. So we see enhanced stimulation of NMDA receptors and we see a higher influx of calcium. In fact, this calcium influx is so high that it's happening at toxic levels, past the amount that is needed for LTP. So what will happen is that at those higher toxic levels, calcium will activate enzymes that damage the neurons. Um, and that will actually hurt your memory for information. Stress, chronic stress, can actually kill your brain cells in the hippocampus. So just as a reminder, calcium exerts several different effects after flowing through the ion channels and the NMDA receptors, as we saw with LTP.
Now, some of those calcium effects are important for LTP, like creating more AMPA and NMDA receptors, but some of them activate enzymes that damage the cell. And this is uh, protective. It basically controls um, runaway excitation of neurons. But as I mentioned, it can cause permanent damage. Um, what you're looking at here is chronic stress and hippocampal pyramidal cell death in um, the CA1 area of the hippocampus. So here you're looking at a normal monkey. Here you're looking at a low social status monkey. Um, this is the vervet monkey. Um, low social status monkeys tend to be bullied and picked on by other members of their species. And this basically creates chronic stress. Um, they tend to report more health problems. Lower social status monkeys also die sooner. And I'd really like you to pay attention to the number of cells you see. So here in a normal monkey, you can see that the cells are somewhat tightly packed together. Here, they're more dispersed, and you can see fewer of them. Um, so this is in the hippocampus, um, but this happens in other areas too, like the prefrontal cortex. Um, and generally, any region that has a lot of glucocorticoid receptors. But we largely focus on the pyramidal cells in the hippocampus because they have a lot of glucocorticoid receptors here. So how does all of this happen? This happens because chronic stress basically disrupts the HPA axis and knocks it off balance. So chronic stress can affect this axis and disrupt this nice homeostatic balance, leading to many different health problems because of hippocampal death. So here's how this is working. So this is what chronic stress does. Hypothalamus it's because this negative feedback loop no longer exists, here's what happens. Um, so the hypothalamus is continuing to increase CRH. That is uh, basically exciting the pituitary, which releases even more ACTH. That excites and activates the adrenal glands, which continue to increase more glucocorticoid release. Now, because the hippocampus is damaged, it can no longer function as a negative feedback circuit for the HPA axis. So its ability to inhibit the axis is damaged. So the hippocampus can no longer inhibit the HPA axis. So because of this, the hypothalamus will continue um, to release CRH, and it will continue to release ACTH, creating more glucocorticoids that will bind to the hippocampus and damage it further. So we lose the inhibition of glucocorticoid production. The hippocampus is damaged and can't inhibit the rest of the cycle. So this loss of inhibition um, creates increased glucocorticoid release and increased hippocampal damage. And it creates a vicious cycle that creates even more hippocampal cell death. So yeah, find a way to manage your stress. So we're almost done. I would be remiss if I did not talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is um, currently classified as a trauma disorder. Um, previously, um, in previous um, psychiatric manuals, it was considered an anxiety disorder, um, but we currently consider it a direct response to trauma. So this is a disorder that is caused by exposure to one or more threatening events. Um, this will typically develop um, due to exposure that either threaten life or cause grave physical harm. Now here's what's really critical. This stressor has to have been experienced firsthand and the person must have had some type of emotional experience that exhibited stress at the time. Um, hearing about the stressor is not sufficient. So there's exposure to trauma, persistent re-experience like flashbacks and nightmares. Um, we will see persistent stress like insomnia, anger, jumpiness, irritability, hypervigilance, etc. And these symptoms have to last for more than a month. 
Now, what's interesting is given that everything that we have learned about the HPA axis and the hippocampus's response to stress, what is especially unsurprising is that relative to control patients, PTSD patients have a smaller hippocampal volume. Um, and this is actually pretty common amongst veterans. You can actually measure the volume in both groups. Now, there has been evidence that this could be due to a genetic predisposition. You're more likely to be diagnosed with PTSD if you have an identical twin that is diagnosed. Um, and typically, PTSD is more likely to be shared between monozygotic twins than for fraternal twins who share less DNA. Additionally, we do know that PTSD, uh, previous trauma, actually predisposes a person to PTSD. Now, it could be that this happens because the HPA axis is already out of balance. And because of that, we have less inhibition of glucocorticoid secretion. Could it be because of greater sensitivity to glucocorticoids? We're not really sure. Oops go backwards. There. Now, in terms of treatment, there is no specific cure. Typically, we will give uh, something like beta blockers. These are norepinephrine receptor antagonists that basically block the beta receptor for norepinephrine. That's why we call them uh, beta blockers. Um, and we can also do psychotherapy. There's ongoing research in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam vets, um, but there are lots of problems with the current studies. Um, lots of people drop out. Um, additionally, suicide and drug abuse is very common. So it's really hard to rate the efficacy of different types of treatments because people don't stay in them for very long. So I know this has been a really long lecture, but let's review. So, a little bit or a short duration of stress, including an exposure to something negative, can enhance amygdala activity, it promotes release of glucocorticoids, and may actually enhance the memory for that negative event by stimulating excitation and formation of long-term potentiation in the hippocampus. But too much excitation, um, leading to chronic stress um, will lead to cellular death via an influx of calcium to toxic levels. Many of the effects of chronic stress are an exaggeration of the effects of acute stress, such as infertility due to reduced uh, sex hormone production or amenorrhea, uh, hypertension, and hippocampal excitation. Chronic stress will shrink the hippocampus, leading to an even more active HPA axis and more glucocorticoid release, creating a vicious cycle of stress. PTSD is a disorder caused by acute stress. However, PTSD patients often continue to live with the stress, like flashbacks or remaining in a stressful situation, like a war zone or abuse, and the chronic stress will sustain HPA axis activity and produce more glucocorticoids that produces more brain damage. So thanks for sticking in this one. Uh, this was a really important lecture. We are going to talk about psychological disorders beginning on the next one. Take care.